thank you, Terry. Thank you, Jeffrey. Uh, thank you for being here this afternoon. Uh, it's a beautiful morning, actually, speaking of the Great White North. Uh, did a little run in Forest Park this morning. Man, it was freezing. So, you uh, ran? And, I, and I did go south to Louisiana, so I, uh, my talks about geographies, mm -hmm. and uh, I've had to learn about geography. I didn't really, I went to Louisiana because I thought it was close to the beach, but I didn't, I didn't know that <laughs> the bayous existed in the way that they did. That was a, a quite an experience. So um, again, it's great to be here. Um, I have a lot of respect for uh, your faculty, uh, Jeffrey and Harry, Gary and Tate and others. So uh, I think you're in a very cool school. Um, <laughs> and I hope I can, I can live up to uh, the expectation. I also am good friends with Bovey Lyons. It's interesting his show is out, out there. We started around the same time, but he went to Arizona. And I went to Louisiana. We were the same year. And uh, anyway, that's uh, it's fun to see his work up as well. So I need a little talk about my work today, but I'm going to ground it in some of my ideas that are uh, that are uh, foundational in a way to this exploration of the, that I'm doing now, or I have been doing my whole life in some ways. But sort of what I want you to keep in mind is I as I front load this lecture with some artists and ideas. Uh, the, the, there, it's germane to the talk, but it isn't necessarily a linear thing where I sort of had these influences and then I made the work. It's actually often the other way around. I made work and then I sort of recognized influences. So I'm going to give a talk about psychogeographies, this idea about how we sort of navigate our contemporary world. Uh, how, do we, how do we traverse different spaces that we live in and we coexist in? and that we uh, are interconnected by, sometimes physically through travel, sometimes uh, through social media, and thinking about how we uh, navigate, but also how we track our time. And often as artists, I think we think a lot about our light, uh, uh, we think a lot about how we map our existence and how we leave record of our existence. So in many ways, it's about chance. It's about chance experience. It's about trying to navigate through that. So psychogeography is not, it's, it's much like a kind of an experience. And so therefore, I'll talk a little bit about Jack Kerouac, Sputnik, and Disney World. Or I might talk about this, really, as body knowledge without sensing and big data. So I'm going to throw in an idea, see what you think. Maybe you could ask me or challenge at the end or tell me. But I, I think today, I think of big data like painters must have thought of photography that big data is to photography what photography was to painting. I'll leave you with that. Body knowledge. When I think about body knowledge, I really think about the idea of the intuitive maker, the idea that we make things with not only our hands, but our bodies, a physical sort of way of intuitively exploring the world as artists. It's an important part. In the idea of technology, there was a period of time, where, and maybe always is with this ongoing conversation about media and technology, that we, that we will be replaced by machines. And so the idea of what does, what does a computer do? What does the human body do? What does our, the relationship of those two? So I start with the, this famous sort of Jackson Pollock moment. Uh, some of you probably saw it at Harris playing him in the movie and remember the line where Lee Krasner is looking at him and basically saying, Jackson, you know, you can't abstract from nothing. You have to abstract from nature. And Jackson Pollock says, I am nature. So it's this idea of, of, of changing the way that we think about what painting is supposed to do as, as a mode of operation. Instead of representing the world and trying to make a picture that looks into a window that is about the, the world itself, it's about expression you know, through the body to sort of make work that transcends the notion of, of representation and moves into another kind of space. And the space, Jackson Pollock would sort of suggest, you know, is a, is a space that is trying to express the moment. Television, uh, radio, uh, airplanes. And for him, he was trying to sort of go beyond, on one level, this idea of representation. On another level, he was still placing himself within that historical moment, which I also think is really important as an artist that we're thinking about ourselves in the historical moment. And what we often think about is originality. In many ways, what we do is we borrow, we constantly, obviously, borrow and imitate something from the past in order to uh, relate our present or project the future. 
So I look at this painting, about the same scale, by the way, Julie Meritu, great painter, uh, similar kind of space in a way, but not really. It's constructed totally differently. You can look into the way that she works, but largely she projections of, of, of different diagrammatic images of architecture and exploding the planes only could probably be realized through computer space. If Jackson Pollock was sort of looking at this, I don't know that he would have understood it, or, or even if we would have understood it, if we were there at that time, how it was constructed and how we're tra traversing the space. So uh, in a way, there's a lot of similarity, but there's a lot of difference. One of the artists that really talks a lot about mental mapping, a uh, very important contemporary German painter, Franz Ackermann, uh, talks about this idea of the global experience, globalization, and how it's constructed, but how we move between different places, different cities, and how he sort of is trying, and through the traditional means of painting, trying to depict um, that reality, that connectivity, disconnectivity. And remember, the globalization sometimes conjures positive ideas, it also has negative implications as well. It has ideas about erasure, losing a sense of identity, losing a sense of, of, of uniqueness of place. And so through painting and through this pictorial space, which again is interesting to see how painting itself rejuvenates itself constantly, no matter how many times it's been declared dead. Two interesting artists here in the background, Andrew Zutel in the foreground, Isaac Genskin. And Isaac Genskin, those foreground towers, are sort of trying to talk about post-Berlin, post-wall Berlin, and looking at the idea of the architectural, uh, architectonic space. In the background, Andrew Zettel is has got this beautiful sort of wallpaper that's an abstraction. But if you look closer, it's the desert, it, encroachment of, of the desert by um, urbanization uh, in New Mexico, and so or in Nevada, actually. So the thing you're sort of looking here, too, is what I'm interested in in that proposal in the beginning, is how do we sort of understand the world in the world of big data and satellites when we can actually see everything literally? How do we understand that uh, reality? And how do we become sort of, how do we sort of go beyond that sort of experience? Because we know no matter how much representation, we still live within our own bodies and we try to make sense of the relationship uh, between things. Another idea about recording, and uh, this, I, uh, this is a, a great artist, Ankuara, some of you might know. He has a great retrospective up at the Guggenheim right now. He just passed away. A Japanese-born artist who lived in New York and Paris and made paintings, these date paintings, since 1966. And he averaged about 60 to 240 a year, or he, the range, he didn't get to do one every day because they're very precise paintings. But they vary in size and they vary in color, but they're largely black, blue, and red, and gray. Um, I found these ones fascinating because you wouldn't necessarily know the relationships of these dates unless you had some kind of genius mind that sort of could calculate that these are Sundays. What they have in common is this organization of painting is just Sunday painting. I like that idea of a Sunday painting. It is nothing like a Sunday painting. He's a conceptual artist who is really trying to sort of deal with something I think is very common today when you think about social media, the idea of recording our existence and sort of not necessarily the banality every day, but just the reality of every day and sort of mapping it in some way, leaving a record of, of his existence. And in the same way, he did these series of postcards and a lot of different work, which I'm not going to be able to get into too much detail, where he basically, as you can see, is talking about I got up at 6.15 PM. And he sent, over a period of 12 years, he sent postcards to several friends. And uh, they were collected over time and reassembled. Uh, and they were very pristine condition, almost, in, at, at the Guggenheim, but they were male. Lucy Lepard, of course, uh, is a famous art uh, writer. So. But uh, again, the relationship to social media at the time he was using postcards, uh, and he was traveling a lot. And again, it's very, it seems very uh, connected to a lot of things that we're talking about today. And Thomas Saraceno, I'm going to just show this one image because I'm interested in this idea again of like, uh, you know, how do we express our contemporary condition? But this is a kind of utopian idea too about how to create spaces that could exist. 
uh, and, and be, as our world is changing and the environment is changing, trying to create structures of spaces that could be floating spaces, living environments, these sort of utopian sort of ideas that have been played out by architects in different ways over time. Now, uh, Terry mentioned my job. It's interesting, you know, the thing about my job is that your environment affects you, and I like to sort of think about that. I've been around not only artists and curators, but around architects, urban design, landscape architects, and you really sort of adopt a certain kind of understanding about the world related to the discourse around you. So the idea of the environment, climate change, issues of urbanization, uh, how to solve problems and how artists sort of navigate through that world informs the work as well. And so um, earlier on, uh, some of you might know, guy uh, Peter Board de de developed this kind of idea of, of psychogeography through the idea of mapping our experiences not by and, and even the idea of travel, not necessarily by traversing a city or going through it by, with intention, but going through it with chance. And reorganizing the idea of how we map cities, not by ge geography, but really by experience and different kinds of demographics, often poor communities or, or different kinds of things. So there's different ways that we understand the world that is uh, organized uh, in, uh, it could be organized uh, through social uh, constructions as well as geographic uh, constructions. So my own work, these are uh, some prints that are uh, a combination of prints that are um, using digital technology, using lithography, using intaglio, uh, using a hybrid of different media to sort of construct uh, the work and uh, trying to be rather fluid with it. In some ways, I like to think of this as even the silliest tools that we are conditioned to use in Photoshop is a lot like making a drip in a painting. Like try to make the, the medium itself do what it does in its best way, in its intentional way, but also in its dumbest way, its stupidest cliche <laughs> way. And so these kind of tools, you'll notice some of them, whether it's a pyramid tool, but it's to try to navigate, or try to uh, look at a space that's an urban space, looking down and floating in this as original idea. I, e, Y, E, D, E, A, which was part of I show. I'm sort of like trying to sort of place myself in this urban space, really largely responding to meta cities like Shanghai and Hong Kong um, and Tokyo and, and, uh, and other uh, cities that are growing so rapidly that, uh, the, the, again, this idea of, of where we exist within this, uh, this environment, but also how these cultures are changing and being reshaped and erased uh, through globalization. And then, you know, playing on the sort of everyday sort of chance and, 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 and in this way, I would uh, say that in a way, just trying to record the most simple of things every day. Uh, this, these prints, by the way, are about 46 inches by 36 inches. And they're mixed media to watercolor is part of the printing process. So the watercolor usually goes first, the printer goes over. Uh, the watercolor actually comes through. This, this one's called Love LOL. And, uh, and uh, again, just trying to sort of play in the studio with this sort of chance experience, but also trying to sort of make sense of the little things that happen every day, to, to record those. Uh, in some ways, being more concerned about small gestures and, and impermanence rather than permanence, or the idea of making a work that's a masterful work, but actually a fleeting moment. This one is, it gets more existential, right? Why? That's the name of the title of a print Y. <laughs> so it's sort of navigating the city, but it's also got this kind of uh, blanket over and looking at the way that, again, the human experience within this uh, construction. And as I tried to set up in the beginning, still borrowing and having a dialogue with art history, constantly thinking about it within the realm of like the canon of art history, uh, often uh, using quotes from uh, them. Even back here in the back, you can see a little Bryce Martin drawing. So I like to sort of play with, or you know, some of the color sometimes is coming from Mondrian and modernism and morphing that, but with the, with technology that you know is is creating a different kind of space. So uh, this one's called uh, Fear OMG, and it's sort of again playing with this sort of deconstruction of modernism, but also the idea of the way that we see globalization again and a lot of things that we experience in our world today, the threat of uh, war, the threat of you know, the kind of uh, uh, 
just the dangerous society that we live in and how these technologies have actually changed our sense of place and geography, but also nationality and borders and so forth. This is just called Bits and Pieces. A lot of it is about play, just so you know, like I, you know, the way I work this is most of it is lots of things at the same time working on the idea of, of play to come up with metaphors for these ideas, but not necessarily literally to set out to do them. So it's also thinking about bodies of works and groups of work. Uh, this is a digital Buddha, which is called Buddha, um, but it's constructed all from pixels, so there's no, you know, there's no object per se, so this notion of ephemerality and the idea of spirituality is embedded in the work. So there's a human condition as well as the other sort of things that I'm sort of trying to bring into that space. And sometimes they just get kind of totally crazy abstract, and, uh, but they're still referential. This one's uh, based on Gerhard Richter's paintings, uh, of, which he appropriates from uh, painting chips, and then another one from Ellsworth Kelly. Um, that is these uh, large uh, prints on canvas that I call stretched. <laughs> kind of like canvas, like playing with that motif. And these are a couple of my characters. I have characters sometimes that help me sort of understand the relationship. This is a very <clears throat> small print, and this is Tweet. She's just called Tweet. She's from a, an old Max Ernst drawing a print etching, but I, I pixelated her and called her Tweet, and the guy is called Twit. <laughs> <laughs> so in a way, sort of these are just sort of ways to play through navigating space in this space. And then the other thing that I'm really interested in is this idea, not of the single image, but the idea of framing the work within a narrative that might be more like a, a poem or a, a relationship of pieces to each other. Well, they can exist, they can also coexist, but spatial relationships and scale become part of the, part of the sentence or part of the stanza. Or the part. So you can kind of just see there's a two smaller prints I've just showed you in the two uh, bigger paintings, just to give you a feel for that. So playing with the discourse, too, of printing and painting, and, and uh, but using printmaking in, in, in its, all its forms as, as a hybridized uh, way of expressing the world, and uh, not seeing necessarily that uh, there is this, uh, it, that it's important to sort of distinguish between what is a painting and what is a print, but understanding that I come from a kind of print uh, based background, so it sort of informs the way that I work and think about replication and uh, original images. So I did a project at, uh, in Orlando at the studio called Flying Horse Press, and I came up with this idea on a more American level, thinking about the American landscape, and thinking about this idea of social nostalgia. The idea that you're nostalgic for the place you're from because you no longer recognize it anymore. And the way it happens in America, it happens often through corporate, you know, uh, uh, you know the, the cities all look the same because of the businesses that you see that, that are pervasive. In, 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 in Asia, it often is because of massive change and, and again, and reconstruction of cities at such a vast scale that local cultures are totally being uh, eliminated. And, and I did this idea, the whole idea was seven days in Orlando, and I would do something from every single day. So the first day I was going in on the, at night into Orlando for the first time, um, up Highway 4, looking at the GPS, and uh, I missed the most important uh, you know, exit that I need to remember at night and end up in the worst neighborhood that I didn't know where I was. And then I couldn't get off the highway because I didn't have any money for a toll. I took my picture, and I thought, shit. <laughs> and, um, but I started playing with this idea of the map and the sort of cutting through of the map. And this is actually just to let you know there's a kind of uh, rice paper and a chanfle and, and a kind of etching map. And these ones are uh, smaller, but they're recto verso prints. They're printed on both sides. So you'll start to see little, some of the images coming through the back of the print. But the idea was basically to map each day, so I thought I would make a road map. And I would try to just pick up clues from the, my daily experience. And, that was one. This could be considered as home, home right here. And this is this idea of soul nostalgia and the idea of Orlando being lost and the beginnings of it being agricultural, orange fever, and the idea of like a wanted uh, poster. And again, this is a series of seven prints, but two-sided. On the back of that print, you can, I think, see the, uh, beneath it. But this is, uh, this is sort of an alligator hand. It's called... <clears throat> minimal painting machine. So I like to play with the idea of the canon of minimalism or abstraction. 
Um, this one is just uh, sort of a cover piece for Orlando, taking the R out, looking a little uh, Jeff Koons-like, uh, Disney-esque uh, drawing. And this is a sort of reference to Smithson's Jetty, but it's called Orlando. Uh, and then I realized in, 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 in I like to run or walk in the morning, so I found, I found uh, Jack Kerouac had lived in uh, uh, Orlando. And during the time he was in Orlando, he wrote Dharma Bums, the idea of, uh, he wrote about spirituality in America. And while he was writing Dharma Bums, On the Road became a bestseller while he was actually in his mother's house uh, writing Dharma Bums, and that changed the whole course of his history and, and a lot of American history. So this is sort of Jack, to homage to Jack Kerouac, uh, but it also kind of looks like a Jack Daniels label. <laughs> And when he was writing Dharma Bombs um, in 1957, just happened to be, this is the chance part of the year I was born, uh, Sputnik was orbiting mm -hmm. around uh, uh, the Russian uh, spaceship was, uh, was, and, the, and the space race was on. So Sput he's writing about Sputnik at the same time he's writing about uh, uh, issues related to the American, American culture and spirituality and so forth. And this one is uh, just a homage to Pollock. See, smiley face Pollock. That's his Pollock <laughs> right there. So. so a play on the World Wide Web. Pollock, right? So. Having fun. That's all. Having fun. And then I, I realized, and again, this is one of those things which I didn't really know at the time, but uh, Jack Kerouac wrote all his uh, books on these scrolls. So this is, uh, this is On the Road, and, and this is Dharma Bombs. And so what he did is you only you can only see there's a, I think there's like a, a space just a very subtle space between he would write continuous for the whole day and when he stopped the next day he would start again and he would just leave a space that would be hard to, to recognize but otherwise it's a it's a scroll and he just kept it hearing it which why it's interesting to think about but in a way now I didn't make this connection but it, it's a little bit encore. You know, recording some aspect of not only writing the story, but his existence and placing himself within the object and leaving a record of writing the story, which obviously has been recorded many times. And so this is the sort of way this operates is as, as, as uh, a sort of map. Um, and then these are edition prints that I was trying to get at the studio there, just so you can kind of see a nice pile of, of objects. But they're too recto verso, so whatever is uh, this is the front and this is the back or vice versa. One side is black and white so and one side is color as a way to sort of organize uh, the piece. This next one is is series is based on storms but the idea came about by by looking at a lot of discarded material that was coming out of architecture studios. These are laser cut plates that architects use to make models. Uh, they keep the, this part and they throw this part out. So there's there's tons of this stuff that's going into the garbage bins. We have 500 architects in our school, so there's all kinds of material that's going out. So I started to look at all this stuff going out at the end of the year and thinking, God, you know, these are ready made and I should start to do something uh, with them. So I started to experiment with the idea. This is me working at a studio in Orlando. You can see this is where I'm the happiest, so if I wear different hats, apron is the best. Apron's the best hat to wear <laughs> when you have lots of color. This is often how I work the first day just generating a lot of ideas, color, but of course I had a lot of people helping. That helps a lot. So when you get to collaborate and have other people who are working on this large uh, uh, press right here, uh, and we're using a lot, I'm using a lot of these cut some of which I found and then some I started to uh, uh, make for myself as I needed them. And this is the first day of just generating ideas and the way that I work with prints is a lot like some of my work with paintings rather than thinking about a plan and organizing in one plate trying to do a drawing. I really try to generate image and image and start the process by really kind of making and seeing what kind of forms I get. I knew I came with this idea that I would make the work based on storms this time. The other one was on uh, the seven days in Orlando. And I would use the name of hurricanes, a male and female hurricane. I would try to marry these two ideas. So first I tried to experiment with these plates to give me just some kind of uh, some kind of language and embossments. And then I started to generate images from maps that I just sorted to be part of a layer. And then I started to make cutouts from the shapes that were part of the laser cuts. And then I uh, started to uh, print 
on uh, rice paper. So there's a shank plate for those printmakers. This, this is rice paper on top of a sinter plate, which is an etching plate. And you can kind of see this is where it's being pasted with wheat glue, and this is the, the underneath uh, the rice paper, as you can see. This is the etching line that's cut with a laser cutter. And then this is the final print. And I'm going to show you a series here. Uh, and this one's called Jose and Joyce, and you can kind of see the beginnings of the name Jose and Joyce. So they're not really based on any storm, and the location is somewhat arbitrary, but they're old maps that are old, kind of lithographic maps, so they give them kind of color and a kind of, but again, it's distorting using the tools of technology. Now, it's a good point to sort of say it. One, one thing about making prints over my career is like, is trying to make it a really kind of fluid process. You know, if anything comes through, I hope it's like the energy and sort of sort of ideas are conceptual. They're locked into titles and, and notions of storms being about really the idea of climate change. One night I was just seeing another uh, one of our storms come in through St. Louis, and I, I just wrote storms again. I um, tweeted that little message out, and I got all this great response that everyone sort of feels this volatility. I thought, oh, there's a great idea. So that's sort of was the beginning of the idea, and I'm going to Florida, so it's hurricanes, and here you go. So, so taking a couple things, it's like a stew, having a couple of conceptual threads, but again, still trying to somehow um, uh, make an make, make a image that is a metaphor for those ideas, and not literalize them, and don't even know if anyone would sort of get them that, understand them that way, but that is the idea of a conceptual sort of basis for making the work. And then the, I'm making the, the calligraphy crazier and crazier. That's still based on the names of writing, uh, on uh, the names and, and distorting them. Uh, basically just trying to use the kind of notion of that, the end of the vortex or the energy of it mapping to a certain degree, uh, but again, sort of not trying to be, and not meaning to be too literal about it because I think that would be the death of it. But uh, you know, these are some of the examples. And then for what I started to do is take the negative shapes of all these storms and make a series of prints that was the sort of more minimal version of these and reverse it and sort of start to think about the, the storm and the aftermath of the storm and the things that are displaced and left behind and kind of the way that they're sitting out there. But still, it sort of lingers back to uh, a, sort of, uh, a sort of idea about minimalism and uh, so forth. And then fun names like Floyd and Fifi. <laughs> it's like a dog. It's like a dog fight, right? right? There's one too, and then and then pairing them and kind of doing a series of sort of pairing them. So so that's sort of how that developed. Then uh, when we were about to get ready to do the show here in St. Louis, I had traveled to Japan and I actually saw Uncle Warwa's postcards in Japan. And I was thinking about what I was going to do for the front gallery because I had very little time. And Bruno and I had been talking in the gallery in St. Louis, Bruno and David Gallery, where I show. Been talking about making the work more accessible. I said I wanted to make some prints for $100 a piece. And uh, he said, no, you can't do that. Uh, yes, yes, I can. And, uh, he, he said, no, no, you can't. I said, no, I'm going to do 100 of them. And he goes, you can't. You, it's only three weeks away. I said, I can. He said, I can. And, and we went back and forth. But I did. <laughs> and what I did was basically take all, all the energy from the drawings and my drawing books, all the energy from the things I was doing, and come up with a, a structure for the idea of making a bunch of work, which was a postcard or an airmail card. I took a 1957 airmail postcard, and I, I just used that as the, I scanned it in, and I used that as the basis uh, for the work. So you could basically, and then I started to cut out and reappropriate different parts from my sketchbooks, from Art history, uh, Sam, uh, with a nice one. Uh, you know, if you're going to look at storms, if, if you look up images of storms, you always see a sailboat because there's always a calm before the storm. Uh, and uh, again, this is just so. What we did, what I did, basically, I say we because I was sort of collaborating in my mind with Bruno. Is uh, there's there's 15 postcards on on every every sheet. Uh, I think it's 48 by 36. And uh, you'll see that the cutout line is, is left in what well, you can't really see, but you may want to show you detail. And the idea is that we wouldn't cut out the cutout line, but we because the cutout line is important to the work itself. But these are the, the series of work that came out of there. But allow me just to be really playful within that structure uh, and uh, allow me to play riff again off of art history and play with a lot of different ideas. This is one of Andy Warhol's Paint by Numbers. SOS was just made up. There's a sort of Gerhard Richter again, 
things from my notebook, um, you know, and on and on. And it couldn't go on and on, I guess. Uh, except then you have to stop. Uh, and so you can see them in juxtaposition. And here you can, I think, see the cutout lines and, and some of them. Unfortunately, a couple of times I have had shows, and everyone wants to cut it cut out the cutout line when they do the reproduction. So they think I really literally need to please cut here uh, when they do the reproduction, but I don't. <laughs> so. And then there's just a, a peek at those. So can you buy an individual one? You can, they're $200 now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We had this, we had a compromise, they're $200. <laughs> and, and you know what we taught? Well, you'll see them here. What happened, I'm gonna, I tell you something about the reason for this is not just accessibility in terms of the money. Accessibility in another way, which I'll show you. This is inside my studio because I thought it would just be interesting to see. I was working on the show. These are those prints, and these are the ones in, in motion. Uh, but this is, uh, this is what happens. If you ask someone, and I do all the time, invite them in and pick a piece, they actually look at everything much differently. If, you, if you're actually looking at things to own them, you start to look at them more closely. So if I bring someone in my studio, I say, and this is where they're all cut down. So I kept one series intact and one cut down. And then when someone wants one, they sort of look through them like this. And they really look at them. And in fact, if you give them, it's like playing cards. If you give them a deck, they'll actually look at them. But if you, if you don't do that, they don't really look so much. But if you say, here, pick one. It's really interesting because they start to get really critical about, oh, I like this one. What do you think, Martha? Hey, you know. <laughs> So, so here they are, the individual ones, just uh, blown up, obviously, but just to show you a couple examples, uh, you know, playing with, with uh, again, text messaging ideas and this uh, storm idea. Um, it allowed me a lot of freedom to make an image that moves from, you know, being more representational, more abstract, more playful, more serious. Well, no, not, too, not too many more serious, but, and fun, but. And just the, the, the way that you can start to reposition that postcard in so many different ways is, is really a lot of fun. Okay, so I'm gonna just do one last series. I think I'm pretty good on time. Um, and uh, this was, um, in a way I'm gonna start with the title here because uh, this is the way I started the show. I, I was uh, asked to do a show in Florence at Santa Rosa Ferrari Studio and uh, I was just coming off of uh, uh, something but I wasn't really, I wasn't really thinking about a whole show in a short time. So I, I came up with this idea because the world was round, but I thought about it in terms of, again, this idea of travel. And, and also that I use my cell phone constantly to take pictures everywhere I am and post them like many of you. But I also started to think that I, I go to a lot of museums, I travel a lot. Uh, and I, I would start to use that in my work. Uh, only cell phone photos. So uh, I created this work between old cell phone photos and the idea of sort of playing with that series that I just showed you, but now they're a little larger in scale. Uh, I'll show you some of these. This, this, by the way, looks like Daniel Buren, for example, a uh, famous uh, French artist, a uh, minimal painter. And it really is a line uh, looking out my window, so it's not really a Daniel Buren. Uh, and we'll go through a few of these. But I started to recycle some of the images that I had and also some of the prints that I had to sort of come up with this idea again of conflating space and time. Some of them come from images that are more from cities. Again, there's that kind of eyeball floating over the space or looking into uh, how things are connected, disconnected. Uh, and uh, this one I call conceptual Midwest. You know, you've got some references of Picasso all the way here. Um, and uh, here playing with the new Gerhard Richter but changing and deconstructing it through the canvas. Uh, craziness, uh, I love that. You know, there's a postcard kind of thing there that stabilizes it uh, for me. <laughs> uh, this one's just called Fool. Um, and again, playing with the tropes of art history. So if you're familiar, you'll start to see things that seem familiar because they are appropriated from photographs of, of painting, but I took them as originals because they're on my cell phone, right? You know, what, you know what interesting thing I found out is I tweet images that I'm not supposed to tweet because I'm not supposed to take pictures in the museum and I tweet them and I hashtag the museum and they retweet them. <laughs> <laughs> and I've asked about that because it's really hard to get rights to photograph for reproduction and everyone has a nebulous answer as to why that's okay. And it's somehow because social media has a whole different set of rules that no one really understands, 
So people are as excited to retweet your tweets. So I did it from the Carnegie International, and they retweeted right away. I did it from Arkawawa and Guggenheim, and they did it right away. And uh, it says right there, no photographs. And, and you know, they're serious about it when you're there. <laughs> <laughs> and this is Brunelleschi, of course, with the, the Domo. I was in Florence, so I had to sort of take up. Of course, this is at the Academy, where it, this is a skull, uh, uh, plastic cast of his, uh, plaster cast of the Academy for students to study the photograph. This is the Da Vinci uh, Mona Lisa. This is what happens in front of the Mona Lisa ever taking photographs. So I'm just one of those people right there. And uh, again, just playing off of, it, of these things. This is uh, a Lewis and Clark drawing, uh, one of the um, series of, of drawings I started to think about how to uh, sort of bring in the Midwest and, and uh, Western expansion into these. And then you start to see them uh, together. And I'm almost done, so I'm, I'm, uh, I'm exhausted. No, okay. <laughs> Just thinking about it now. And you know, a lot of the things playing in the studio, like this particular piece, has no reference other than me scrunching up a ball, tracing paper, throwing it on my floor, photographing it, and then coloring it. <laughs> so you know, but it looks like something. I, I get it. Mm -hmm. It's like an environmental thing, you know. It's, it's trying to also, because I need some anchors in this larger piece to these spaces. They're quieter. I get a, these, these are from the Yale, the British Museum at Yale. There's a lot of great battleship paintings and, and things like that. I love this one in Mondrian. I just mm -hmm. sort of doubled the Mondrian and then I curved it. And you know, it's, it's the sail, Mondrian sail. Mm -hmm. so, maybe my favorite. And then there it is, kind of all together. Yeah. And then I brought it to Italy with me, and those are two of my friends, one uh, writer and one fashion designer, uh, just to see it in situ. And there it is with my storms together. And there it is looking from outside on the street level. A lot of fun. Um, have that show on uh, San Gallo, right outside of San Lorenzo. And then I'm just going to end with my Daniel Buren. It's a double Daniel Buren. <laughs> but you see, you see, it's really, it's looking out my window at Art Basel. I was in Basel, and I looked out the window, and I said, there's a Daniel Buren everywhere. Mm -hmm. so, and that's why. Yeah. That's the end. That's <laughs>